Ron Perlman is a furry, Ian McShane is Quint from Jaws, and Michael Shannon is drunk off his ass on moonshine and running around in a Bigfoot costume. In a new holiday classic, the whole family can enjoy. The f*** is this? Welcome back, ladies, gentlemen, and however else you wish to self-identify, to the f*** <laughs> is this. A podcast where we watch and then talk about weird and bizarre movies. Now, there are a lot of other podcasts that are also about this same exact idea, but we have something those other podcasts don't have. Which is? Uh, uh did you want uh, me to... Uh, uh, uh... Uh, this set of jangly keys. Ah. Ooh, listen to them jangle. Oh. Can't, Maybe we should go back to writing other intros. Get, <laughs> can't get that from Paul Shear. My name is Kaz Les Scarf, and oh, joining boy. me is yeah. my co-host, Jingleson Rafter. Yeah, if you can't tell already, this is supposed to be our Christmas holiday themed yes, episode. Yes, we're feeling. You could have easily like incorporated the jing- the jangling keys as Santa's sleigh bells, but uh, but yet didn't. Those are they were jangling. They're not jingling. Jangling. These are jing- these are decisively jangling keys. I don't have jingling keys. What kind of fool do you take me for? I bet if you look up the dictionary definitions, both like jangle and jingle are like interchangeable. Don't even get me started <laughs> on the Oxford English Dictionary. We're already off to a fast start. <laughs> yes. Uh, Worst yes. Christmas ever. We are in the festive mood because it is The Fuck Is This Presents, the all-inclusive, non-specific, winter-based holiday cheer fest. Ah. We ran that title by our lawyers to make sure absolutely no one would be offended. No, but you, it would have been nice if you had ran that by me before I just blurted out Christmas. First. That's okay. I can edit, <laughs> I, I can edit it out. Yeah, just I, edit, my, edit my voice out, but put like your exact yeah, phrasing over I'll just, it. I'll just edit it out, just like religion has been edited out of our public school system. Okay. Yeah. Okay, Kaz. <laughs> <laughs> Did our lawyers get back to you about that one, too, or...? <laughs> No, those are just my own uh, oh. personally held beliefs. Mm. Uh, rest assured, I'm going to go on many a rant about that. And in all of the Tim Hortons I can find, I'm going to uh, loudly uh, say, I like your decorations. You know, they don't let you say Christmas anymore. That literally happened to me two days ago. Really? <laughs> yeah, I was just standing there, and this lady's just like, it's all about Jesus. And I'm like, lady, it's still November 30th. <laughs> uh, but anyway, we're getting wildly off track and here. And you're just like, oh, maybe I don't need Tim Bits today. <laughs> That's, of course, a misnomer. I always need Timbits. Oh. My body is 80% of it. But joining us for this... This uh, holly jolly this, episode. Yeah, joining us, we have a very special guest. She's an actor and an improviser with off-key improv. Please welcome to the show, Zosha Cassie. Hello. Hi, guys. Hello. Hi. Thanks for being here. Thanks so much for having me. I am so excited, especially because this is like a holiday, Christmas, holiday cheer extravaganza you got, yes, episode. Yeah. Couldn't have said it better myself. You got, you got to sandwich the Christmas between two holidays to let everyone know that it's like, I'll get off this train. People people, people can't be as up in arms about saying happy holidays anymore, right? That's Not like, really. That's I mean, an old thing. Yeah, I mean, like, I'll just say, like, happy holidays because I'm in including New Year's yeah. and, like, you know, who knows, like, what denomination I'm talking to, right? But, like, yeah. I'll say Merry Christmas because, like, it makes my mom happy. Same way, like, how I'll go to church on Christmas Eve because it makes my mom happy. I, I say Merry Christmas if people say Merry Christmas to me. In general, I don't I don't really greet people. I don't have specific greetings for people. I think because half of the time I don't, I don't remember most people's names. <laughs> I, I love all the holidays around this time. I think I just love lights and like cheer and mm. warmth and and sparkly things. So <laughs> it's, the, it's the perfect time of year. Yeah. You so bad? any holiday, I'm good. Mm. Oh, there's just like the warm, fuzzy feeling that comes from like all oh, the bright lights and the warm <laughs> scarves and the hot cocoa and the, the feel good songs. It's a wonderful time of the year. I just wish people wouldn't stop, like, would stop bringing all the fucking politics into it. Yeah, well... They're ruining up what should be, like, a delightful thing that brings people together. Oh, well. So, Zosha, on this show, we watch crazy, strange, baffling, bizarre, awful, terrible, shitty movies. What is one of the weirdest movies you've ever seen? One of the weirdest movie-going experiences you've ever had? Okay, well, you phrased this as the weirdest. Sure. Not... So, I'm gonna go with that word. Yeah. 
Okay. It doesn't necessarily have to be bad. Okay, so know. here we go. Mm-hmm. Mulholland Drive. Yes. Mm. Oh, okay. Okay, you agree. Or, or I agree that it's a very weird movie. movie. Okay, okay, yes. Because <laughs> I thought, because I think, not being a huge movie aficionado, I thought, Mul- I think Mulholland Drive has a reputation for being, like, really niche and cool. But I just thought it was weird and didn't enjoy it. I think that's like just the, the David Lynch factor mm-hmm. of it all. It's David Lynch. Yeah. Yes, it is. Yes. David Lynch. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. He's I, everything. Yeah. My big confession, uh, possibly to you, Kaz, is I am not much of a David Lynch guy. Yeah. You know, like I, I like his movies are a little too abstract for my liking. I like like clear, concise narrative, story structure kind of movies. I, and his stuff is just a little too bizarre for me. I have a David Lynch confession as well. <laughs> I used to work in an independent video store when I was living in Calgary, and I went on a, a kick one month where I said, I'm going to watch all of the David Lynch movies. So I've seen every movie that David Lynch has directed, but as of right now, I have still never seen a single episode of Twin Peaks. Oh. And when oh. I bring that up to like my <laughs> cinephile friends, they all go, Ooh, what? Because that's like the crowning achievement of what... David Lynch has pulled off as that TV show, but it, I just, it seems so, ah, uh, this, it seems like such a hard show to get into. I've never attempted it. Interestingly, I have seen the first episode mm. of Twin Peaks mm-hmm. because I will watch the first episode of anything. And I knew in my mind somewhere that it was David Lynch, but it's not surreal and bizarre, at least to me, I think and give difficult it time. for me to, like, understand. <laughs> I, time? I, think, okay. I think Twin Peaks is a... Fine. I think Twin Peaks is a slow burn. Okay. <laughs> Based okay. on not having seen it, I have a feeling that's what it is. But I, um, I have, uh, like, another David Lynch confession. Sure. I, I have also <laughs> seen... Welcome back to David Lynch Confessions. <laughs> <laughs> I have also only seen the pilot of Twin Peaks, and I figured, like, oh, okay, wow. I don't really need to, like, you know, watch it. But I have played, from start to finish, Deadly Premonition, the game that is somewhat loosely based on Twin Peaks. I've played Deadly Premonition. That's not... That doesn't... That doesn't really feel like a David Lynch. Are you, know you what? sure? You know what? That? I haven't played it in a while. I just remember that being really terrible. Oh, it is. It's real. It's, maybe a, I it's to, a slog to get maybe through, I, but you cannot turn away. Maybe and I we could to, spend an entire podcast talking about Deadly Premonition, but we're not because we're here to talk about fucking Christmas movies. Maybe we're. Maybe, maybe I need to go back and, and replay Deadly Premonition from the point of view that it's a David Lynch, a lost David Lynch classic, and maybe I'll get maybe I'll get more out of it. Well, uh, that's a, that's a perfect segue. Of I can never think of one. Uh, my other question to you is going to be, what are some of your favorite Christmas movies? Ooh, okay, I was guessing you might ask me. Ooh. So, mm-hmm. favorite Christmas movie of all time is The Santa Claus. Great. Mm-hmm. Okay. It is a family favorite. Yeah. We watch it every Christmas Eve. I love it. How many, time, how many times would you say you've seen... It, so, it's every every Christmas. So. Yes. Yeah, so, it came out... I want to say it came out in 2000. Oh, no. No, much, much earlier. Yeah, I'm going to say around 1995. Oh, okay. Mm-hmm. So if I'm 95. not mistaken, okay. it was the first live-action movie movie Tim Allen was ever in. Yeah, and it, he was never bigger than he was in like. Oh, he was Santa huge when Santa Claus was. Yeah. Oh, and it yeah. wasn't just the fat suit. <laughs> <laughs> he made at least one home improvement joke in the Santa Claus. Oh, yeah, he went, he went, oh, ho, ho. <laughs> oh, there's that one. He's like, something, something, a tailor, because he's like Tim the two-man tailor. Yeah, yeah. Oh, yeah. Um, there's a lot of reference. There's a couple references. So, the Santa Claus, I think probably we started watching it the year it came out, or maybe like one year later. So that's a solid yeah. 25. Yeah. 25 years. Yeah. I have a th- or so. yeah. I don't like being reminded of my own mortality. <laughs> yes, every day when I look in the mirror. Yeah, I have that. I have this theory that, I mean, every time people or ask me or I try to compile a list of my favorite movies or the movies I've seen the most, I feel like uh, a lot of people, when they make those lists, they try and go for, you know, like the cinematic classics or, or the ones that make them feel good inside. Mm-hmm. I have a feeling most people, not not everyone, because not everyone celebrates Ooh. Christmas, but most people, if they were making a true list, at, at least in their top five, it would be the Christmas movie that they watch every year. 
Mm-hmm. Like, I know for me, I have not seen the movie more times than Muppet Christmas Carol. I mm-hmm. must have, I, I, I clearly have watched that well over 50 times now. Mm-hmm. I can probably quote that movie from beginning to end if I have to. Mm-hmm. Yeah. It's like one of the best depictions of the Christmas Carol. Oh, if not yeah. the best. Mm-hmm. I don't think there is an yeah. Ebenezer Scrooge that is better than Michael Caine's portrayal in that movie. Yeah. And I will say, like, you know, it's funny you should bring that up because, like, the holiday season, the Christmas season for me doesn't really feel complete until I see National Lampoon's Christmas Vacation. That's another one. That, of is, my a, that is like a sentimental yeah. classic. My, to me. my dad loves that movie. Mm-hmm. Yeah, we, I, it's it's Muppets at my mom's house, Lampoon at my dad's house. Mm-hmm. There's just something about like you know wanting to build like the perfect family Christmas, and like everything yeah. goes to shit, and everyone is kind it's of very, miserable, but they're yeah. all together for it. And like I think that says like sort of a lot about like the human condition and like this all grand comedy that we're a part of. Yeah. It's a wonderful No, movie. oh man, I, now I just want to talk about Christmas Vacation for the entire <laughs> podcast. That's great. The one anecdote I'll share is years ago, uh, my dad was visiting here, me here in Vancouver and at the Rio Theater, they had rented it out because Randy Quaid was oh, uh, no. showing his documentary about uh, the oh. conspiracy in Hollywood that forced him and his wife out of out of the Hollywood system. And my dad and I drove past the marquee, and my dad looked at me and said, "Like, should we? Can we go to that?" And he's all like, "You want to go to the Randy Quaid documentary?" He's like, "Yeah, I want to go." And I like the question and answer period. I just want to go. Morning, shitter was yeah, full. I was gonna, I was gonna say, <laughs> <laughs> you stole my joke. I was gonna say like uh, you went to the ticket to the box office and they said nah. Sh- it's of sold out. It just said shit is full. Shit is full. <laughs> oh. I always regret the fact that I never took him up on that. Mm. What could have been? Mm. Well, speaking of Christmas movies, of course, that brings us to uh, today's movie. What, what, is, what I'm sure is going to turn out to be a future Christmas classic. Today we're watching a movie from the bygone day of 2017, mm. so it hasn't really had time to gain much of an audience yet, but in the pop culture rest like assured, mm-hmm. in five years from now, it'll be December 24th, mm. and there'll be a little girl in a pretty dress covered in bows, and she's going to run up to her father, and she's going to going to tug on his sleeve or mother but for the purposes of this story I'm going to use I'm going to I'm going to fall back into my into the patriarchy so she's 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 tugging on her father's sleeve maybe the mom's dead I don't know who knows anything could happen in this situation (laughs) and she looks at him and she says Papa 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 may we please watch Pottersville (laughs) and her father will look down on her and say of course no Christmas would complete without a viewing of Pottersville Mm. so today's movie is Pottersville. Wonderful. And before I describe just what the hell Pottersville is, I'll, I'll go into uh, I'll go into the filmmakers as we always do, but I'm going to do things a little backwards here. I'm going to start off by saying who the cast of this movie is. Okay. In particular, I'm going to uh, say the main actor is, the lead actor, because this is what made me stop as I was scrolling through Netflix and I was looking for weird holiday movies that we could watch. Mm. I came across this one and I saw who the main actor was and uh, I couldn't quite believe it. So the main character of this movie is a character named Maynard Grieger. Okay. And he is the nicest guy in, in town. He's the nicest guy in Pottersville. He runs the general store. Uh, he always gives people, you know, credit when they're, when they're having, uh, hard times with the family. Sounds uh, delightful. He always, he always helps people out. He's the nicest guy in town. Mm. Everyone likes him. And he's played by Michael Shannon. Zod? <laughs> Famed, intense, terrifying character actor, oh. Michael Shannon. Oh, shit. What was the name of the guy who played on Boardwalk Empire? The crazy super Christian, I mean, like, yeah. young officer who was like, like, he killed a guy, yeah. and then he impregnated, like, a, a mistress, and then he, I don't like, remember, but, yeah. he, became, he became a hitman. He's I mean, intense. He, yeah, I mean, he was, he was uh, technically the good guy in that series, sure, but yeah. he was, he was the scariest character in that. You know, he was, he was terrifying in Shape of Water mm. and countless other films. And in this, he's playing our Jimmy Stewart archetype. Oh my god. That's the nicest guy in town. I don't see it. <laughs> I know. That's why I chose this particular wow. movie. Uh, joining him in this movie is a venerable supporting cast of actors who are far too good to be starring in something like this. We have the hilarious Judy Greer. Oh, yeah. From Archer and Arrested Development. Say goodbye to these. (laughs) (laughs) We have Al Swearingen himself. Ian McShane. Oh, shit. From Mad Men, we have Christina Hendricks. Okay. From Reno 911, we have Thomas Lennon. Oh, nice. And no holiday movie would be complete without a visit from Hellboy himself, Ron Perlman. (laughs) 
Oh my god! He's in like every movie I'm seeing lately. Yeah. <laughs> Hello, Ron Perlman. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> it's me again. Yeah. So yeah. <laughs> well, I yeah. just watched Drive, and like there he is. Oh, there he is. This is a Drive reunion because Christina Hendricks is, is also, also in Drive. Drive. Yeah. Ah. Yes. But he has a doubly good reason for appearing in this movie because he also produced it. Okay. Yes. Wow, what, a, what an eclectic mix of like serious dramatic actors and comedic actors. Mm-hmm. Like, Wow. What could this be? Dramatic comedy? Yeah. <laughs> I'll tell you a little bit about the movie. Do you want to bring it up on Netflix yeah. and search for it? Yeah, here? yeah, because, yeah. Because, uh, keep talking. We don't, do we don't have a, uh, a DVD cover to show you, but, uh, we do have a, you know, an image on Netflix. A, a, an image that exemplifies this movie, and it's the one made me, uh, stop in my tracks because, uh, well, we'll just, uh, Keep talking. I'm still searching. <laughs> yeah. yeah. I mean, like, frankly, it, it looks like a, um, Pottersville. There we go. Okay. Go into the next, uh, well, oh, no, 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 you gotta go into the, uh, keeping all of this in. Oh. No, just, like, just, literally go over. Okay. Like, move looked, the joystick over. You've looked, lost, you've lost it now. Oh, God. <laughs> you had it before. Did I? Oh. There it is. Okay. In the center. Yes. There we go. Oh. Yeah. <laughs> That's a new logo. So, so, so click on that. Mm-hmm. You'll bring up the bigger one. There we go. Oh, okay. Where is it? Oh, yours does this thing. It does, yes. So. Ah, all right. It's just showing the entire movie. All right, it's, never mind. It's not this legal with eagle with the cigar and the eye patch. That's is the it? thing. Here, hold on. I'll bring up the thing on this. Is and this that will like be... Ron Perlman's this... production? Company? I hope. <laughs> hopefully. Now, take a look at take a look at this poster. Ooh. This looks like a fake fucking movie, doesn't it? Yes, it does. Like Michael Shannon's head does not match the proportions of his body. <laughs> so uh, yeah, Pottersville. It was directed by Seth Henriksen. You would know him from. Nothing. Okay. Uh, this is the first movie that he's ever done. He uh, directed a short film called Zamboni Man, which is a very sweet little short film. It's actually available on YouTube. You can watch it. It's about 13 minutes. Uh, but it also stars Michael Shannon okay. as the titular Zamboni Man. I see. So uh, I think we know how he ended up in this movie. Mm-hmm. And it was written by a guy named Daniel Meyer, who you might remember from also nothing. Ah, I This see. is the first movie he's ever written. Not a lot of credits to speak there. He has a couple of acting credits. He has had a role in an early Vince Vaughn, Paul Rudd movie called The Locusts. Mm, and that's mm. all the information I can bring up on either of those gentlemen. That's really all I have to say, except for the fact that this movie, this Christmas movie, um, got a couple twists in it. Uh, <laughs> one of the twists, I won't tell you, because... Why shows, bring it up? Because <laughs> it, it, it comes up pretty early in the movie, so I won't reveal that particular twist. But the one thing that I, I will say is because it's to your interest, Jameson... Because Pottersville is also a Bigfoot movie. Oh, okay. So just for you, to, like, I'm, I'm not a super, like, Bigfoot conspiracy nut, but I am working on an animated project right now with a friend of mine. It's about, like, a hiker who finds Bigfoot and then tries to help him, like, you know, meet other big feet. <laughs> so, Aww. yeah. So we're, 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 we're kind of, like, working, we're, we're in a bit of a, a Bigfoot kick. Cool. <laughs> Appropriate. That's I mean, the word. Harry and the Hendersons. Harry and the Hendersons. Yes. Right. That should have been a Christmas movie. Yeah. Put the, put the Santa, how long was that Sasquatch with them? And Most long enough movie? to find their way into their hearts. But, <laughs> did, but like, how long did he live, how long did he live with them? Oh, I don't know. Uh, do, you, do you know? I don't know. It's been oh. a long time since I've seen that movie. Yeah. Long but long like, time. if he lived with them for a while, he clearly, maybe to do like a, have you, have you seen the, there, there's this commercial out right now where, um, where E.T. comes back and <gasps> yes. he, yeah, and he yes. visits Elliot and he's a grown, and it's just a, com- it's just like a four minute commercial for like, some, Xfinity. Yeah. Oh, that, that's like something they would do for the fucking Super Bowl. It like, was. Like, did, it yeah. during the Super Bowl. Did it? Oh, yes. Yeah. I saw oh. I, I watched parts of the Super Bowl this weekend. Ooh, yeah, I, I think, like, didn't they have one where, Wait, like... did the Super Bowl just happen? The Super Bowl happens in February. Oh, sorry. Uh, right. I don't know anything about football. I watched <laughs> some football. Oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> you watched the Super Bowl commercials and then a football game broke out. <laughs> yeah, there were some really good commercials, and it was the E.T. commercial. Okay. I was getting confused. So, like, why did they air the ET Christmas commercial during the Super Bowl? <laughs> Good lord! No. Anyway, my point was they should do a uh, a reunion. They should do like a Harry and the Hendersons Christmas yeah. commercial yeah. where he slings yeah. for like Burger King. Yeah. Or <laughs> John Lithgow needs work, right? In my imagination, he, like, celebrated Christmas with them, but that's just my, like, fan fiction imagination. But, yeah. Harry probably celebrates the same holiday that Chewbacca celebrated in the Star Wars holiday special. Life Day? Yeah. Oh, man. Yeah. It's a very, it's a very Harry and the Hendersons Life Day 
special. Uh, get get featuring, on it. Featuring B. Arthur and Jefferson Airplane. <laughs> I don't think. Yeah, I don't think. I, I think all of them are long dead mm-hmm. now. Well, well anyways, <laughs> I am looking forward to uh, Netflix adding a bunch of um, like Christmas movie recommendations because I watched Pottersville. You're welcome. <laughs> yeah. It's the season. Yeah. All right, we're gonna go uh, see what Pottersville is all about, and we'll see you after the break. Thank you. And we're back. We're back from Pottersville. We're back, and we're we're awash in in holiday cheer and, and goodwill yeah. towards our, our some, fellow people. Something like that. Something along those lines. <laughs> yeah. How was that? What in terms of Christmas movies? Was that one of the weirder ones you guys have seen? It wasn't really even a Christmas movie. I, I kind of. It was, I, I kind of right. it, it was like kind of tangentially associated yeah. with Christmas. I mean, in the same way that I guess Die Hard is associated with Christmas. This mm. is a movie that's set at Christmas. It opens with a Christmas song and it ends with a Christmas, you know, everyone getting together and doing a nice thing. Mm. But for 80% of the movie, it, it has nothing to do with Christmas. No one even mentions Christmas at all. Yeah. Mm. So happy holidays, everyone. Yeah, no Santa Claus is to be shown <laughs> or anything like that. It's snowing. <laughs> But I will say that, like, um, like I mentioned at the top that, uh, you know, one of my favorite Christmas movies was Christmas Vacation. I think what I like about that is that it's a very offbeat kind of Christmas movie. Mm-hmm. And this is a very offbeat kind of movie in itself. And I think that's what really endeared it to me. <laughs> it's a very weird movie, but it has it, it has a heart. Mm-hmm. And it, is, it is very sweet. Mm-hmm. And I think the only thing that keeps it from being a successful movie is that it's not terribly well made. Mm-hmm. There's uh, mm-hmm. lots of moments where you know, uh, two characters will be talking and then they'll uh, cut to uh, the exterior of the general store and then it'll cut back and they're still inside the general store only now a new character is walking through the door and you just think well that seems like an awkward way to splice those two scenes together did did no one understand the flow of uh, new characters walking in and that's just something that I noticed over and over again. There was lots of uh, cuts to random exteriors that didn't necessarily need to be there. I think also the motivation no, sorry, the the way the plot gets to can I talk about like what happened? Oh yeah, we, that's we, the whole okay, we usually recap like okay, the great. entire plot of yeah. the movie. Yeah. So the motivation for the protagonist, for Maynard to dress up like a Sasquatch <laughs> <laughs> it's funny to say that out loud. Is so how it gets there is just so weak. It's so weak. It's just stumbly and janky <laughs> and like not good. But you kind of buy it though. Oh. It's, it, within within the logic of I this can, movie, I can <laughs> buy like maybe the first instance that he does it. Yeah, but like you kind of lost me at why he kind of perpetuates well, him going out and sasquatching around town. You lost me at why he has all those different costume pieces in his shop like yes. at all yeah he, well he has the he has okay all right all right well we okay. Should, like, so okay we as, start we're capping I'll the just I'll just clarify so as, as we said so Michael this is a movie where Michael Shannon's character for reasons that we will go into dresses up in a variety of just bits and pieces and he makes the, an outfit and he goes on a drunken rampage and the next morning everyone in town is a buzz because they've seen the Bigfoot or the Squatch. Yeah. As many people refer to it as this is the first movie I ever heard the term Squatch. Yeah. It's it's good. I like it. I like, I'm going to start using that in my day to day thing. <laughs> but yeah it's like a, a lot of camouflage wear and then a fur a jacket. A gorilla mask? A, a gorilla mask but and a fur jacket. We know specifically why he has the gorilla mask because he goes into the back and he gets a box that's labeled Halloween costumes. I did not see that label. And you have oh. to remember this is a very small town so the only general store in town would be the only place you could get a Halloween costume. Yeah, one month out of the year it's a spirit of Halloween. Yeah, and it would just be whatever that town could get. Yeah. Okay. And the rest of the stuff that he's wearing, I assume, are just hunting things, because it's a, it's a small town, it's a hunting thing, so he's like, you know, camouflage stuff. 
stuff. And when he first put it on, because he puts on what Kaz is explaining to me is a camo outfit, <laughs> but what I thought was a lycra top and leggings. Yeah. It was sort of like when you wear like a Michelangelo's David, like crazy, oh, like, like a bodysuit, like legs. Yeah. Like, oh, okay, yeah, yeah. yeah. I can see I that. It was yeah, like a joke, like novelty <laughs> lycra <laughs> outfit. Yeah, that's what I thought. It was. <laughs> I mean, who knows? Maybe he, because he, he clearly caters to, like, the specific townsfolk in town. So who knows? Oh, I mean, maybe there's at least 30 people in town who okay. need to have, like, a variety of uh We gotta get to this. Changes. Okay. So, yeah. all right, all right, all right. So, let's go back to the top. The top okay. of the movie. Yeah. Okay. So, Michael Shannon plays Maynard, mm. the nicest guy in town. He runs the general store. His one employee is Judy Greer as Parker, mm. who's just the nice girl next door, mm. who, who clearly, to borrow a term from you, Jameson taking a shine to Maynard but it's mm-hmm. never quite a shine because he's married to uh, Christina Hendricks mm-hmm. but Michael Shannon's character decides to leave work early and visit his wife because he's yeah. just he's, he's just that wholesome of a good guy he's going to surprise his he, wife he's with got flowers some, and... he got some elk steaks from his good buddy uh, mm-hmm. Ian McShane yeah. <laughs> Ian McShane also gives him that beautiful piece of wisdom right oh, which yeah. is that you need to go live Maynard because yeah. like, we're just on we're a li- rock we're curling living on this rock curling space. through space and there's only one way off. The way I look at it, we live on this tiny little rock that's flying through the blackness of space at about, what, 60,000 miles an hour, and there's only one dumb way to get off it. If that thought don't make you crazy, I don't know what the hell will. Jesus, Ian that's, Machine. That's, that's our Ian Machine's third line, and by, by, <laughs> by the, it's like, it's, it, there's no quicker way to endear yourself to a character. Like, as soon as mm. he was done saying that, I'm all like, I love you. You know, every, you're great. You're, you're everything awesome. that I've ever seen Ian McShane in, he always has, like, this very flowery way of, like, speaking. But yeah. it's a very, like, blunt, harsh, flowery way of yeah. talking. And, like, I just love it. He's great. Ian McShane is someone who I, I almost prefer it when he uses an American accent in movies. Mm-hmm. Because his natural British accent, obviously... Uh, he sounds, you know, he sounds lovely, but when he puts on that Mm. American accent, Mm. you're right, it's very poetic. He's very, yes, he's very flowery with his Mm. delivery, and it's nice. Yeah, he's nice to listen to. Yeah, but it's also, it's flowery, but also, like, he's pissed off at you, and you're intimidated by it. (laughs) I know. Every every word out of his mouth is just peppered with such contempt. It's great. It's fantastic. (laughs) So, yeah, he gives him the advice, he gives him the elk steak, and also, he gives him a bottle of his homemade moonshine, (laughs) which is going to come back into play almost immediately. Yeah. So Maynard goes home uh, to surprise his wife and he hears like a ruckus upstairs and what he should know he hears is... A, this is actually oh, yeah. very sweet. He hears a howling. Yeah. And his first instinct is... No way. Did she get a puppy? Like a very childlike innocence way of doing it. In, in only the way that Michael Shannon can yeah. deliver. Only in a way that Michael Shannon playing against type can. Yeah. <laughs> so he goes into the bedroom. And as we're watching this, it's like, yeah, he comes home to an empty house... And he's doing the whole, hey, honey, we got an amazing evening plan, and you're and sitting you there, can, and you're... you can, like, smell the affair coming a mile away, right? right? It's yeah. not quite the affair you think it's going to be, yeah. though, <laughs> because what happens? He opens the door, and he finds her in a bunny costume, dancing around with a man in a wolf costume. They're furries. <laughs> they are furries. Yes. yes. Which I did not see coming in a Christmas movie, especially. This holiday movie has an entire furry subplot. And yes, unless you you think that it's confined to this one scene, oh no, the furries come back. Mm -hmm. They come back a lot. Yeah. Lest you think this movie could take place, like, decades ago, I feel like this makes it, like, curious. Yes. (laughs) So, yeah, Christina Hendricks is dressed up as a bunny rabbit, and Maynard catches her with uh, someone in a wolf costume, and uh, as soon as the wolf starts to speak, you instantly recognize as Ron, Ron Perlman. Perlman. <laughs> Uh, and it's it, like it's so awesome because like like they they insist that it's not they're, like, they're not having sex. It's yeah. not necessarily an affair. We don't have sex. That's right. According to the club, you can't even have sex. Club? What club is this? Well, it's kind of a club where we you dress up like a squirrel and have sex with my wife. Club? I'm a wolf. But she just wants like some kind of excitement that like Michael Shannon is not able to provide. Yes. I, As we continue to watch, like, that sounds like a line, but it actually seems to, as the furry plot unravels, seems to be true. Yeah. Yeah, it's a community. 
city. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah, there's at least, they, they mentioned there's at least 32 people mm-hmm. within yeah. this furry club, within mm-hmm. this small town, which I have to imagine is like a fourth of the entire population yeah. of. So what do, what do you think they do? What, what, how, what is your guys' knowledge of the furry community? Uh, I mean, and based on that, what do you think they're doing in this movie? Well, like, when my... they meet in a room together, a close, a, a closed door room with no other people. I mean, I know from, like, that one scene later on in the movie, what they seem to do is just dance around and paw at each other. I think there's just a lot of rubbing yeah. going okay, on. so it's, like, a tactile thing? Mm-hmm. Yeah. I, I thought, and I get, I, I mean, I have really limited knowledge yeah, of it. Yeah, but I have a rudimentary uh, understanding of it right. myself. Yeah. So I thought it, I thought people were having sex when they were f- do furry things. Yeah, but apparently that's like an outdated misconception. Oh, I feel bad, okay? I don't okay, know. Yeah. I think there's different kinds of furries. Like a subsection? I think yeah. there are furries uh, that find it to be like a sexual kink. I and think... if that's your thing, fine, cool, Oh whatever, yeah, totally. Like... Yeah, we're not knocking the yeah. furry community. It's, it, it's a very it, it's a very silly, but ultimately a very innocent thing mm-hmm. to do. There's far worse things to be in life yeah. than a furry. But like, uh, but in this movie, like, it's so immediately shocking when you yeah. see it, and then they throw out all these, you know, correcting the record, like, yeah. we're not having sex, like, this is totally innocent, like, we just want something more, and like, I'm still kind of processing... Oh, is she having an affair with them? Like, oh, that's Ron Perlman no. under that <laughs> She's having an emotional affair. Yeah. I, I guess. I mean, this is just a weird mm-hmm. marriage. I mean, like, mm-hmm. clearly Michael Shannon and Christina Hendricks are totally wrong for each other, but it takes an entire movie for them to come yeah. to terms with that. I got a lot to say about, about both of those characters, because both of those characters I just need a lot. Uh, a yeah. little bit of professional help, but <laughs> I mean, is there is is there a greater on screen entrance that you've seen this year than Ron Perlman in a wolf costume, angrily asserting the fact that he is a wolf and not a squirrel? I'm a wolf. Ow! Get it? I mean, it, it doesn't even make any sense as a squirrel. It's got to be a wolf. Yeah. <laughs> three times. Three yeah, times. Exactly. And then probably there's, well, uh, a great reveal that is connected to that, of course, is that when they go to the sheriff's office. Later it on is, the movie. Yeah, it is an immediate cut to the sheriff behind his desk, who is Ron Perlman. <laughs> so he's, he's, I enjoy that. Well, well, he that. insists, well, like, as, like, <laughs> in the midst of this, like, heated conversation where, like, he finds them you know, in the throes of an affair, he says, like, hey, Mater, can you do me a favor and kind of keep us under wrap? I'm kind of like an important figure in town. (laughs) So so really, more than anything, this is a movie about Ron Perlman as the sheriff of a sleepy small town who is Is trying to... Is cuckolding Maynard. (laughs) He's trying to... Well, he's trying to... Well, no, he's not cuckolding Maynard because he even goes out of his way to say, I had no idea that was your wife. I never would have done anything if I had known that that was your wife. Oh, you're right, you're right. I'm just in it for the club. Right. And it's it's him, but he he has shame. He yeah. he, he, he mm-hmm. he's ashamed of the fact mm. that he's a furry. And yeah. over the course of this movie, he learns to be open about being a furry. That's and, and, very and, true. And, and he say, he's proud about it. And he, he shouts it from the mountaintops. And all he gets in return is just a scorn and animosity from Ian McShane, who has some real prejudices. Yeah. But but like I guess like you know more true to the fact is that uh, it's just revealed over the course of the movie that. Yeah, Christina Hendricks is just a horrible wife. Like, the very next day, uh, Michael Shannon, you know, sees her uh, walking down the street, and he runs up to her and says, What did I talk to you about last night? I know we need to talk, Mater. I just can't right now. I've got something to do. What's more important? Um, big foot. Really, that's mm. that's more important than the dissolving of oh, of your marriage. Yeah. Who, that, that's it, I, how, who knows how long yeah. they've been married. Yeah. Do we even like after like he discovers them having an affair, he gets drunk off the moonshine? No, no, no. That's the next thing. Yeah, yeah. Talk then he just, yeah we, we're talking so much about like their affair and what leads up to it and Sasquatch, but we never really know or we never explain how it ties together. So because he sees them having an affair, he gets drunk on moonshine that night and dresses up in like his Sasquatch gorilla outfit and then has a drunken rampage through town. This is probably one of my favorite scenes in the movie. I mean, it's sort of like a like a like a supervillain origin story. The way that it's <laughs> shot and the way he acts in it, because he's like he's like surling, growling into yeah. the mask and like. He- He, he 
comes back to the general store where Judy Greer is still kind of closing up Ooh. and he's drunk off his ass on moonshine and just this scene of the two of them interacting <laughs> is amazing just the way that drunk Michael Shannon talks the way that he imitates the sound of a wolf <laughs> I went out to breathe some life and then life decided to take a poop in my face so I ended up breathing poop instead Grabbing squirrel poop, to be precise. What, Maynard? You're not making any sense. You're right, because he wasn't a squirrel. He was a wolf. He was a wolf. Ooh, ooh. Uh, doesn't work. He's a squirrel. It only works if he's a wolf. I'm sorry for the confusion. It was a wolf. <laughs> I, I, th- I really think... The way that... he asks if, like, if she's in the furry club. Yeah. Let me ask you a question. This is very important. Belong to Furry Sex Club. I think you'll be fine by yourself. It's important to me. Yeah. You don't want you to wind up like a furry animal sex. Well, I, I, I'm going to come back. <laughs> I really think this performance really helps signify how Michael Shannon is sort of this generation's answer to Christopher Walken. Because mm. it's just the perfect scene of how. Well, do you mean in that it, he's it, exa- like- it exemplifies how neither of them are able to play normal people, mm. doing normal things. It's like, yeah. okay, okay, Mike, you're drunk, you're upset, we want you to sit on the stool, and we want you to make a sound like a wolf. Ooh. Cut to him making a sound that no wolf or any animal on Earth has ever made. Yeah. Ever. Ooh. His natural... <laughs> That his was probably his eight, natural like inkling is to go towards either creepy or yeah. awkward or stilted. Oh, <laughs> the, I mean, like, Michael Shannon in this movie, it, it, he's very quiet. Mm-hmm. He's playing the role very reserved. And, mm-hmm. uh, and like, most of the roles I've seen him, he is always a character, like, seething with, like, rage. Like, just, mm-hmm. a, just a, like, a fraction, like, beneath the surface. There are so many shots of just his face in this movie where... Like, his yeah. lip is quivering yeah. or his eye is twitching or he something. He is always one second away from snapping and yeah. just murdering everyone. Mm-hmm. And, and, like, you ass- and you assume when he gets drunk that that's when mm-hmm. his, his murderous rampage is going to start. Like... The scene that you just mentioned where he puts the gorilla mask on and looks in the mirror and says, oh, you know what a gorilla would do to a little bunny? Ooh. It's funny that you mentioned Mulholland Drive because just change the music to that scene and you're watching a David Lynch movie. Yeah. Like, it, it, it is. Oh, yeah, the music the way, in this movie The way help. it's shot, <laughs> like, the way he's acting, Ooh. it's terrifying. I, I love the next day, like, the um, the drunken super recount from the townsfolk on TV. Like, oh, yeah, we saw him, like, ran off into the dark. And it was, like, he, was, he was like a... a seven foot tall monster if I had ever seen him and you know he was like staggering through the bushes and scaring our dog and everything and I'm like like, have you ever seen this, like, a like a drunk asshole, like, just, like, running down the street, staggering down the road? That's not really intimidating at all. <laughs> the town is very suggestible. Like, Yes, the, they're all the, fucking idiots. The, yeah, the town, I mean, like, they, they get caught up in Sasquatch fever, and they immediately start elaborating, or not elaborating, but uh, um, making... Bigger. This is another part. Exaggerating. Exaggerating. Thank God. No. They keep exaggerating the story to where it's like, oh, he's almost as big as a house. And it's Ooh. like, yes. okay, even if you did see it, you, you clearly didn't see a man as big as a house. Ooh. There's a moment where him as the Sasquatch runs past like a family Ooh. decorating in a Christmas tree. And the kid sees him and goes, hi, Bigfoot. And he stops and he waves. And it's like, okay. okay. Yeah, a closer he, inspection, you should be able to see like, this is clearly a guy in a suit. Everyone can see that this is a guy in a terrible suit. Yeah. But, and, and like around town, like if you saw like just like some like local, like, oh here here comes a uh, old crazy so and so in his bigfoot uh, costume delighting the townsfolk. Like now it's just like a wholesome thing that happens every year. But no, they still believe that it's legit Sasquatch. Well, in in all the shots of him running around outside at night, he's the only person running around. <laughs> so I can't figure out if he does it right when the store closes, which I'm assuming is like nine o'clock. You know mm-hmm. where. 
Or is he doing it at 2 a.m.? Why is there no one outside ever? <laughs> Except when he sees the family in the yeah. window. But most mm. of the time, I did notice. The streets are completely I empty. think that's largely because it's not a terribly well-made movie. Yeah. You, you would think that there would be a shot of, like, you know, old man Jenkins or whatever locking up his store and then Bigfoot runs by and goes, Oh! But, mm. but no, you're right. It's yeah. all just yeah. static shots of him running down an alley screaming, which, I gotta admit, made me laugh every time. Yeah. It was oh. great. I mean, if anything, watch this movie. Movie to watch Michael Shannon wear a, a gorilla mask and just he's <laughs> yeah! I mean, just rampaging downtown. Also, the town is which backlot is it? Because or not backlot, but it is. Um, oh, like what kind of like Hollywood backlot? Yeah, because it's so. where they film Gilmore Girls. So, oh, like, is that it? Is Stars Hollow? Oh, you've reckon? Oh, really? Uh, really? <laughs> oh, <laughs> yeah, really? Oh, cool. Yeah. So whatever I'm gonna look that up. it is, yeah. I just wasn't sure mm-hmm. which studio, but it's it's that studio. Yeah. But like, so, so, so that's fun. Yeah. So, um, like, all these Bigfoot sightings, like, you know, kind of revitalize the town economy because, like, there's that, so, you know, there's that barely mentioned stuff where, like, the mill that employed half the town closed down. So, like, now all the Bigfoot sightings are driving tourism. They're all selling t-shirts and, like, Bigfoot hot dogs or whatever. It was I- filmed in Hamilton, New York. So, if that's where they filmed Gilmore Girls, you're oh, right. Oh, no. It just looks so much like the studio where they filmed Gilmore Girls. Never mind. Wow. Ha- okay. <laughs> Maybe all okay. small towns just sort of look the same. I'm looking up where, so I'm looking up where Gil- oh, Gilmore Girls was filmed in Toronto. Mm. I mean, all over the place, but. That's close enough. Yeah, I could. I mean, whatever. You know, close okay. enough. Mm-hmm. All right. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, well, uh, the same. but yeah. So Michael Shannon decides that he's going to like rather than just like remorsefully say like, "Oh man, that was a crazy night. I'm never doing that again." He tries I, to come clean to Ron Perlman. He does, um, but then he realizes that like, oh, the the whole town is sort of like coming around to to Sasquatch. Mm-hmm. So like, I better keep this up because I am such a doormat <laughs> that I have yeah. I can't disappoint the town. But he's he. he I, I kept waiting for like a moment where like like a, like a Clark Kent moment. Or it's like, oh, I'm trying to get in touch with Bigfoot. Like, oh, I'll see what I can do. And then he, like, leaves. It. <laughs> you ever notice how you don't see Michael Shannon and Bigfoot in the same room together? Like, yeah. can't wait for shit like that. Like, he goes into a closet and comes out as or fucking like, Bigfoot. Or, like, he, like, leaves, like, the headpiece yeah. on yeah, yeah. Of his head by accident. Yeah. yeah. That what's what's that glove you're wearing? Oh, oh, this? Uh, uh, nothing. <laughs> <laughs> can't wait for shit like that. He really gets into it, too, because he starts taking notes. He so he starts yeah. taking, like, notes, like, how does Bigfoot walk? And I kept mm. waiting for, again, I feel like this mm. might have been a funnier joke if it, like, panned back. And, like, he's done, like, one of those, like, post-it notes attached to, like, the string and everything. Oh, and yeah, it's just, like, like all of his stuff. Bigfoot research. Mm. Yeah. Mm. Doesn't quite go that far. So, eventually, all this Bigfoot commotion attracts the attention of Thomas Lennon's character. Brock Masterson. Brock Masterson. The uh, monster hunter. The monster hunter. <laughs> There's a rumor floating around there may be a Sasquatch in these pants. Exactly. Follow me on Twitter. Who is... I love characters like this. I love pompous frauds all full of bravado. And, like, like Thomas Lennon looks like he's having a fucking blast playing this role. He is so good in this movie. He was born to play someone like this. Yeah, I, uh, I do think this character kind of hijacks the movie and he overstays his welcome... Maybe a little bit. Maybe a little. Yeah, I guess. But like he does it. He does. I think eventually, every... kind of great on the nerves a little. Bit. I, I, I. Yes, he does. But, but he but, does have some genuine. But lines, I, think so I will every, agree with. I you. will say, like every joke that you could make with this character, they mm-hmm. make. Like, yeah. like the ones where he wants to keep redoing his takes. To, like, like for like one for the camera, one for the promos, and like you know, he clearly doesn't know what the hell he's talking about. He's just in it for like the fame and whatever. I like I like the moment where he's he's in the woods and he's talking to his agent and and the makeup lady is and he's uh, is uh, touching up his face and he's just saying one thing Ooh. and then out of nowhere he just grabs the makeup lady's hand and just go like I will bite it off if you do that again I'll bite the hand clean off yeah Thomas Lennon has an outrageous Australian accent this accent is incredible it's it, it, one of the most finely crafted bad accents I've ever heard mm. Scotch particularly the yeah. North American scotch is uh, drawn to wood, and the reason being um, because the wood has uh, so much of a sap. It's got tons and tons of sap, and the scotch uh, feeds on this sap to feed its powerful libido. Mid word, he will slip into 
other accents. Mm -hmm. Sometimes he's from New Zealand. Sometimes there's a little bit of Cockney in there. Like he'll, yeah. like he'll drop, like he'll, he'll throw in like an oiv or something like that. Yeah. Sometimes in scenes where his character is you're doing retakes for his show, he will say like the same word differently. <laughs> like there's that one part where he says like, well, we go to get us some sip. We go to get us some sip. Like yeah. he just yeah, like, he, he says, finds new ways to say sap things. about five different ways. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I feel like the writers or the writer yeah. uh, found their groove with that character. And then also the actors seem to be having a fantastic time. Like everybody understands that character. But then the writer struggled before that character and after that character. <laughs> yeah. I, I think I was just so charmed by weird Michael Shannon trying to play a human being mm -hmm. that I was a little disappointed that there was so much Thomas Lennon. I, mm -hmm. I think Thomas, I think, I, I think you're, I agree with you. I think the way he played the role was exactly the way that role needed to be played. And mm -hmm. I, I think he, he really nailed the snake oil salesman who's full of himself. Yeah. I just didn't think there needed to be so much of him. Mm -hmm. You know? I agree. I think I do actually feel like I'm just because you hit your stride and yeah. you, you find like the pocket mm -hmm. or something, it, it, it like shifted the focus of the movie. Mm -hmm. Actually, I, I, I do understand like the tensions in the movie was like, you know, the good of the town and the community versus fame. Mm -hmm. But it seemed like the good of the town and the community kind of was fading faded it was like doormatty um yeah. and then and then the fame was like really a heavy push well, like it seemed the tensions were not actually push pull equal well like to that point michael shannon and pam greer's characters are all very subdued compared judy, judy greer judy, yeah, if judy, pam yeah. greer was the love interest in this movie that, that would be sorry, amazing no, judy greer that I'm would sorry, be awesome sorry. No, that would be a completely no, judy different greer movie was like <laughs> She was also very subdued in the character, and she is, like, very, like, most of the stuff I've seen her in, she, like, plays it very broad and somewhat crazy. Some and, of the and, time. and in this movie, like, she's, like, she's very compassionate and, and caring. I've, I've and, seen her, unfortunately, play this role a, a uh, couple of times. Judy, Judy Greer, unfortunately, does often get cast as just the mm. supportive girlfriend mm. type. I didn't Which see... She, and she's great as, like, yeah. the wing nut. I didn't see... I didn't see this movie, but uh, I did uh, recently notice she's in the trailer for Playing With Fire, that John Cena movie where he's the firefighter and he okay. has to look after, like, the three kids. And she's, like, the wife or something? Yeah, she's, like, the girlfriend and okay. it looks fucking terrible. Okay. Yeah. Well, like, she gets stuck in those roles. Well, my point is, like, they are very, you know, like, even kill, like, straight characters. Yes. And later on, Thomas Lennon is paired up with Ian McShane's uh, character when they decide they're going to mm. collaborate and going after Bigfoot. And these very broad characters, and uh, and Ron Perlman goes along with them for, yeah. for the ride. <laughs> and when these three characters are on screen yeah. together, like, I'm reinvested in this movie mm -hmm. because they are, like, they play off each other so well. And I would never have thought that, like, Tom Lennon and uh, Ian McShane would have been, like, a good yeah, comedic foil like pairing, but they are. They are. Well, if you if you look at what they're doing, they're doing like the very classic comedy archetype. Like it, it really is, you know, like what the Three Stooges did. Tom mm. Lennon is the wacky one; he's being the curly, mm. and Ian McShane is clearly the mo because he's the one with the brains. He's all like, ah, you knuckleheads, and, that's and not threatening, a thing. With, threatening with violence. Yeah. <laughs> and Ron Perlman's just the straight man who kind of just observes and mm. makes comments. Yeah, on so we'll side with either or. Yeah. Like, to support whatever like, comedic tone you're going for. Yeah. But I, I love that. I thought they were great together. Yeah. I, I want to see. I want to see more of uh, Tom yeah. Lennon and Ian McShane together. There's a lot of enjoyment to to, to get out of this movie. Great example of. Uh, a movie you you don't think Ian McShane would work great in, but he's absolutely hilarious as Hot Rod. Yes, yeah. yeah. He's great as the he, dad who's dying who he, just wants to He's fight hilarious who just caught, he's, only, he's dying of cancer, but every time mm. you see him, he's beating the shit out of Andy mm. Samberg. It's great, yeah. yeah. <laughs> he's great in those roles. Mm -hmm. So, like, as they're, like, going through the, um, the forest, like, trying to, like, set up their traps for, uh, for Michael Shannon, uh, he's still gonna go out and, like, put himself in danger now that, like, yeah. these... These dangerous hunters are going after Well, because them. specifically, they're in the store, and, and he overhears Tom Lennon's agent talking to the cameraman, mm. and she says, well, there isn't going to be any show if we don't get a good shot of Bigfoot, which mm. they haven't gotten yet. So you know, Michael Shannon is starting to realize the danger that comes with dressing up as Bigfoot, mm. but he knows in his heart. This he is has, the right thing to do. He's got to put on the feet and mm. the mask. He's got to do it one more time. <laughs> Otherwise, the town... Will be lost. Yeah. yeah even though if town. he gets, even though if he gets captured, they're going to be disappointed in many ways. Yes. <laughs> he's also there's also a moment where he's talking to Judy Greer and he's saying like, well, what do you think they're going to do if they catch whoever's pretending to be Bigfoot? And she says, 
oh, well, you know, uh, Ian McShane will probably just shoot him in the head and stick his head <laughs> up on the wall. And Michael Shannon has this look as if he is genuinely worried that his good friend of many years mm. will do that when he finds out that he's been dressing up as the yeah. Bigfoot. Well, Ian McShane yeah. in this movie is like a reclusive fur trapper who, who just steals his own moonshine in the forest. He's like... Clearly, a little off the uh, the deep end. He's here. also blatantly Quint from Jaws. He is so Quint, from, right he, down he, to the went... chalkboard. They all know who I am. They ripped two lines from yeah. Jaws for him to say five thousand to go with you, ten thousand to find him and catch him. <laughs> Ian McShane um, also has. Sorry, go ahead. Oh, I was just gonna say he he's painted as a guy who basically lives off the grid, right? Mm-hmm. So then I love that they have to have him watching TV at the end of the movie. <laughs> so yeah. he is watching TV on, I believe. Well, it looks like a tiny radio, yeah, yeah. with a tiny screen. Mm-hmm. The tiniest. It's not like I'm gonna get TV, but it's gonna be the smallest TV available. Did it have, yeah. did it have the antenna bunny ears? Maybe I think it was black and white. Okay. I, think, I mean. <laughs> He lives in the woods, but he's still part of the community. He comes yes. into town. Well, and that he's becomes still... very clear that yeah. he loves the community. Oh, yeah. yeah. <laughs> they'll, they'll buy his moonshine. <laughs> uh, Ian, Ian, well, because yeah. he's... He saves, them. he saves them in some ways, right? He does. Yeah. Yeah. Well, because he, he's not completely off. He, he's the hunter. He hunts game, oh. and then he goes into town to sell that. He's, he's providing a service oh. that all small towns need, so he's oh. not like the crazy guy out in the woods. He's playing a character who's rooted in reality. Mm-hmm. Yep. He just happens to make his own potato vodka yep. out of a yeah. bathtub. Well, <laughs> so, and he he is the one who ends up exposing the, the big monster cons- hunter oh, yeah. guy. As, yeah. as the fraud that he is. Yeah. Yes. And yeah. that takes away, what's the word that I'm looking for? That eliminates yeah. the law. See, it's not always easy, right? To remember <laughs> yeah. just like words yeah. that you use yeah. every day. Yeah. That eliminates the lawsuit, which the town is extremely upset about okay. because the monster oh, hunter. Yeah. We're, we're jumping sort of to the end of the movie, but okay. since we've brought that up, let's, let's talk about this. So, I mean, yeah, lo- lots of things happen in the middle of the movie, but what happens near the end is, uh, yeah, eventually Michael Shannon is caught and tranquilized and revealed to be the man behind the Bigfoot. Oh, be- yeah, because uh, Judy Greer, uh, like she says, she like she learns the she learns Michael Shannon's secret. Uh, so. And, 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 like, yeah, from that point on, she, like, she treats it like, like, her friend has an addiction, so, and she is just... <laughs> I didn't think... I, I, I could see that, but that's... Uh, so, uh, there's the scene where the two of them... There are so many scenes in this movie of the two of them alone in the general store closing up. I think there's at least three different scenes where he says, hey, can you take this bag to the bank? Mm. Um, they really enjoyed doing that. Mm. There was so much focus on the money bag that goes yeah. to the bank that I was like, you this thought is it was going to be this a thing? Important. Yeah. It's going to be stolen. No. She's going to be mugged. No. Yeah, and you, and you got to dress up as Bigfoot to chase down yeah. the robbers and yeah. that was a superhero movie. That would actually yeah. be a good scene. That would be fitting. Which, um, but she treats his, like, you know, going out as uh, Sasquatch as, like, it's, like, this addiction of his. And she's always like, hey, do you want to, like, just come over to my place and we'll watch a movie? And it's like, hey, uh, why don't I, like, walk with you to the bank or something like she's that? She's being a good friend. But there's there's the scene where they're alone and, he, and he, she says, oh, I'll drop the money off at the bank. Do you want me to go get the bag? He says, yeah, sure, it's in the back office. And she walks back and she finds the bag with his Bigfoot mask in it in if this were any other Michael Shannon movie... He would be in the doorway. Yeah, like. <laughs> this would be the moment where she realizes her friend is a serial killer. Yeah. He's the Iceman. He's, I'm going <laughs> to have to kill you now. <laughs> but instead you it's know this too much. movie. <laughs> But yeah, like so when they capture the Bigfoot, she's like, "You, you fools! Like this is you fool. this is Michael Shannon, and he's and if you she, tranquilized an innocent man." If she hadn't have done that, it might have been okay. I'm yeah, just this, gonna put out yeah. there that he kind of looked like a beast because his head was down and he was tranquilized in the back of a truck. I'm and gonna most, disagree with you entirely. He was very clearly a man in but, a cheap Halloween no, mask. But, but most the of the town, ta- oh, the all town of the town, is all, yeah. the town thought he was a beast. And that's kind of all that matters. I mean, first of all, the whole town believes the Sasquatch is real. Yeah. Be like, believes everything that Brock, like, tells them about, like, who he is and 
they're just all starstruck anyway. They're pretty dumb. Yeah. They'll believe anything. It's also worth mentioning that during that scene when the entire town is about to watch the reveal of who the Bigfoot <laughs> is, a good quarter of them are all st- are still in furry suits. That's right. <laughs> they're just kind of, it's the camera doesn't linger on them. They're just kind of off to the side. They're in yeah. the crowd. Yes. <laughs> and no one thinks any differently of it. I think, yeah, I think this town is a, I think that's what Ron Perlman ultimately realized is this town is actually far more accepting of his lifestyle than I think he realized. Well, when they, when they reveal like that they've captured Bigfoot, I assume like the entire town is out there and there's like what, 60 people there? And, yeah. like, they've mentioned that, like, there are 30 or some odd members yeah. of the I, of I think the this court. town maybe has a population of 90 people at the very most. Yeah. We we forgot to mention a giant plot point. This used to be, a, like, a mining town, but, like, the mine is shut down, and there's, like, foreclosure signs, and people are super broke, and uh, buildings are all boarded up. Mm. And that's something that happens at the very beginning of the movie. So the mm. reason that this town gets so Bigfoot crazy is because it's actually a source of income for the first time. Yeah. It's, it's revitalizing the town. Yes. Yeah. That should it's have been something, something to believe in now. Yes. So yeah, that's something that we should have mentioned. Something I also think we haven't mentioned that we sort of alluded to is that uh, Brock is not, in fact, Australian, mm. which is something that we find out... He's a total fraud. Pre- pretty, pretty early. I mean, like... We could have guessed based on how terrible that accent was, but it could have gone either way. It, mm. it, it could have been a choice <laughs> to mm. do a terrible Australian accent, but no, he's he's of course an actor, and of mm. course he's a fraud. And but when it's revealed that Bigfoot is a fraud, he immediately turns around and says, "I'm going to sue the entire town." And we later see him talking to a reporter, <laughs> saying that specifically, "I am going to sue 82 people." Mm-hmm. So he's he, he is mm. selected yeah. a majority of this town to specifically yeah. sue. And what do they say? Like, and, and you're seeking uh, somewhere in the neighborhood of like fifteen thousand dollars in damages. And he's like, uh, I think it's he, more than that. More than yeah. that. But like, he, yeah. but he just goes like, yeah, that sounds about right. That sounds about right. Like, he's not even sure like why he's suing them, and we're yeah. not sure why he's suing them. He just says it's a reverse class action because it's <laughs> eighty two people. <laughs> So my so my theory on that is that it is it's revealed that at the very very end of the movie he, uh, Tom Lennon gets for kind of being like our central villain mm-hmm. uh, I guess for lack of a better term I he, mean like, he gets a really lame comeuppance it's just sort of revealed over a news report that he's also found out to be a fraud and then we see him getting booted from. Uh, network. Yeah. <laughs> just, the, just the network. It just says, he, he, he gets kicked out of a building with, with cardboard boxes and the building just says network <laughs> on the outside because that's where he works. My theory is this. So he had like this big show of bravado and he says, I'm going to sue an entire town. And then he actually followed through with the paperwork. Yeah. And, where, dur- and during yeah. discovery, they found out like, wait a second. Where he had no choice but to reveal that that's not his real name. <laughs> yeah. So really, he ended up screwing himself over. <laughs> I, that, I mean, it. the movie doesn't tell us oh, this, but that must that's have been what, what I think that's what happened, oh, right? Yeah. I think the the hunt I this is my theory that mm-hmm. the hunter somehow exposed him. Oh, you think Ian McShane exposed him? Yes. How did he do that? Well, the movie's not that well written, no. so I have to put the <laughs> yeah, I know. together on my own. And, you know, <laughs> well, there's like, there like most good se- movies. There is a sequence where, like, I was like, the revealing to the town that it's Michael Shannon in the suit, where Ian McShane is in, like, the front of his car, and he's leaning over, and it looks like he's recording. Like, he looks like he had a hmm. camera in his head. Like, both, like, I just thought it was actually know, something that, to do that, with that, because there was that. so much dialogue about, like, what is all this technology? Technology because the of course the monster hunter has all this weird technology that like won't actually catch a monster and then the the hunter uh, Ian McShane has, has, has his, his actual everything. technology and yeah I, did, I mean when it, when it was just the three of them did he ever let the American accent slip did did the monster hunter no, no. well no, when he was he, taking he a, when he was taking a dump in the woods he wasn't using his American accent but who knows if Ian McShane Heard right. him say again. That's okay. a scene that you think might have been written. Where mm. yeah, Tom Lennon goes to call his agent when he's taking a dump in the woods, mm. and he lets the accent slip. And then Ian McShane comes out of nowhere and tosses his cell phone into the woods. And you would think his reasoning behind doing that was because he discovered that 
he was a fraud. But mm-hmm. no, that's not what the movie shows us. That's just something. Again, it's an assumption that you, as the audience member, have to yeah. make on your own, mm-hmm. which means it's actually it just a badly written movie. And I guess I think it because isn't there a shot? This is why I really think that he had something to do with it because there's a, the last we see of Ian McShane in the whole movie. If, if, right? Am I right about yeah. this? Or did I create this? Ooh. It's him in his pickup truck, and it, he like gives a nod. To, yeah, to, to I, I thought that was weird too, but I thought I kind of thought that was just like a way of closing out the movie with Ian yeah, McShane like, with a twinkle in his I, eye. I've going, always I've always got your back, Michael Shannon. I was here too. Yeah, you know? okay. well, yeah. Mm-hmm. But possibly it it's, than... it's fine. It's they're they're all good theories. Mm-hmm. Why not? <laughs> this is the type of movie you might as well make your own theories <laughs> that is about. Yeah. yeah, it's open to interpretation. <laughs> all of this. Okay, so this is where the movie at the end gets its. <laughs> Gets its big really? heartwarming Christmas moment. It's holy shit! Like we're writing a Christmas movie. Like we we yeah. gotta wrap this up in a oh, yeah. Christmassy bow. Oh yeah, so yeah, so yeah, 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 yeah. Like, this like reeked of like a last second, like before like the filming wrapped up. They're like, yeah. oh shit, we forgot to write an ending. Yeah, <laughs> this is. I mean, like uh, this is barely a Christmas movie. It op- the opening credits have like like a swinging kind of Motown Christmas song yeah, over like, it. And then there's a montage of him in the Sasquatch outfit that's set to Lovely Weather for a Sleigh Ride Together with yeah, you. Yeah, yeah. And then not until the very end of the movie does the movie remember, oh right, this is supposed to be about Christmas, isn't it? Mm-hmm. It takes until the movie's almost over to remember that it's meant to have like a holiday message mm-hmm. because throughout all of it, mm. no one mentions the holidays once, I don't think. No. no we don't know when it, Christmas is. Yes. Yeah. I mean, mm-hmm. it's it's winter all the way through the movie. Yes. But it's more of a winter movie than a Christmas That's movie. That's right. Mm-hmm. Yeah. yeah. Um, it's a cold weather movie. <laughs> it's a cold movie. Yeah. Oh, man, I love cold weather yeah. movies. Yeah. Uh, you know, I'm going to have a cold <laughs> movie marathon. God, I love it if this movie took place, like, on December 28th when everyone still yeah. has their Christmas shit up. But, like, like Christmas is, like, in the past. Yeah, we never see an after Christmas yeah. movie. Uh, it's, yeah, a January... Fifth yeah. movie. <laughs> so Parker like kind of gathers everyone in the town and uh, Pam Greer. Pa- yes, Pam Greer, <laughs> Foxy Brown, <laughs> Jackie Brown. Uh, she she was both Foxy she, Brown and, and Jackie Brown. Brown. Yeah, exactly. So she just gets all the town folks together and you know, calls them out on like they're turning their backs on uh, on Maynard and says like all this time when like times were tough for you like uh, he was he always had your back when you couldn't pay like any kind of thing from the general store he wrote down like your name in a tab and you've all. He never called any of you. He never turned you down for, like, just, you know, put it on my tab. We, he never asked for a collection. We see that in the first scene of the movie, there's there's a mom and her kid, and they're buying groceries that, that are about, like, $50 worth of groceries. And she says, you know, husband's still out of work because milk closed down. And he says, no problem. And he grabs this big ledger, and he says, don't worry about it. I'll put your name here. You can pay me later. Ooh. And it, it's in this scene that we find out that everyone is town has done that at some at, at at some point in time. And this is the big reveal when Judy Greer brings out the ledger and she opens it to reveal that it is completely empty. He she, has never like co- like taken down anyone's no. like collateral or whatever. And it's meant to be this heartwarming moment, but really more than anything else, it just <laughs> exemplifies he's a terrible businessman. <laughs> How terrible is this general store man. staying open? <laughs> I don't know how how he can afford to have his employee to be honest. His yeah. one employee. One, yeah. Who well, seems to be working there at the yeah. same time as him. Frankly, I can kind of I can kind of see why his wife is a little frustrated with him. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> he's not bringing home the bread. No. <laughs> They're just not a good fit. They want that, different I, things. I, I suppose, but I don't know. I can also see why like a lot of the town's folks like would turn their back on him because like they seem to have been doing it for most of uh, this town's existence. Yes. Yeah. But it's but you will it, never collect. But it's only when Foxy Brown calls them on it. To I love that. I love that you said that. That that you know they're filled with you know the, the spirit of the season, and we get our big get our big Capra moment where everyone comes back comes back into the store. There just happens to be a television reporter mm. ju- just there. Mm. What was her name? Stephanie Gutierrez. Gutier- 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 yeah. This is Stacy Gutierrez. Yeah. So they have this moment where everyone in town pays back their loans. And well, put, I mean, they, they pay put, what they can. Like, I yeah. think they all throw them like five bucks. That's each. the thing is they start <laughs> piling their money onto the counter and it's meant to be like this big sort of Frank Capra moment. And there's even uh, the Ron Perlman's even in the corner drinking a root beer and he goes, Man, I'm bigger. 
richest man in politics. Yeah. At the very most, that pile is worth maybe five hundred yeah, bucks. That's, yeah, <laughs> if, if, if that. If and that. Like, I, I didn't see Ron Perlman like tossing any money. Did he just jack like a root beer or something? He's like, like, ah, I'll pay him back later. <laughs> put, 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 me, put me down on the ledger. <laughs> put me down on the ledger. I'll pay. I'll pay you back next week. You get it, right? Yeah. Ooh, sorry. I'll get you back. Yeah. So yeah, and. During this moment, Christina Hendricks comes back, mm. and because she's seen the news report on TV, she's like, "Oh, now my husband is interesting." So she comes well, because to the... he does have like this really heartwarming speech where he is like, "Oh, I just wanted to do something to." I know everyone in town has like had hard times, and I wanted to like you know just give some hope and people and they seem to really enjoy it i she was not moved she, she was also no. knows that he dresses up in an animal costume now right and oh, that's yeah. her thing mm-hmm. she's yeah. actually real like that's why she's yeah. into it yeah yeah <laughs> and then but then he does the only but i also want to po- like i also want to point out like in the scene right before this she ordered him to come back to their house and pack up all of his belongings. Yes. So now he has officially moved out of their house mm. and I guess is about to leave town because he's also packing up the general store. Mm. And only now when he has a slight modicum of fame does she do a complete hairpin turn mm. and, and come back to him and say, hey, baby, come on back and bring the Bigfoot costume. Mm. It's like, no, you are a bad person. And, and he's, I'm and sorry, he, you're and not And Michael Shannon rightfully says, no, I think you were right, we should split. He yeah. still insists, like, you know, you deserve to be happy because he yeah. is, like, you know, that kind of sad sack. Like, you know what I thought was a real <laughs> missed opportunity? For him to just call her a bitch or something? Well, okay, look, so, like, the movie wants to have sort of this joyful, Christmassy, good-feeling ending. But there are two characters that have very unhappy endings, and they don't get... The the resolution that they need. Christina Hendricks is now like, oh, well, now I'm now I'm divorced, so I'm going to go off on a hop. And Tom Lennon gets exposed, and he loses his job. There's a scene earlier where the three hunters are going through the woods, and they think they hear the Bigfoot going on. But what they is is they stumble. It's really funny because because no, yeah. Ron Perlman's in the back going like, like, hey guys, guys. There's nothing there. Come on, let's let's go back. This probably isn't anything. We probably shouldn't oh, go over guys, here. Guys, what day is it? Uh, <laughs> maybe we should. <laughs> yeah, and it's a furry like party. I was about to say society, I was about to say orgy, but it's not really an orgy. No, it's, it's like a, a big, it's like a bigfoot party. party, furry it's dance party. Celebrate. They they yeah. said it, it's our first annual bigfoot celebration. Mm-hmm. Right. That's what they said. And, um, and they're just hoping to meet bigfoot. They're hoping to meet yeah. bigfoot. And we see during that scene that Brock Masterson is kind of getting into it, mm-hmm. and they're kind of they're kind of like rubbing him, and he's kind of all like, oh yeah, yeah. And then and, right, and, and right. as Ron Perlman like kind of goes through it, he gets like entranced and yeah. like just remembers his roots as a furry, so he's no help. <laughs> and at the end of that scene, she takes off the bunny head and she says, "Hey, what? Are you ready to text me? Just let me know. I will. I will, and I do, and I will." Those two characters should have ended up together. Yeah, yeah, I yeah. Totally agree. That and was, then she gets yeah. the excitement and everything that she wanted, mm-hmm. and it's like, well, there you go. They're they're the villains of the movie, but at least they get a happy ending, and then everyone gets yeah. a happy ending for Christmas. Mm-hmm. Yeah, like, you know? she, like she, de- like she would get like a happy ending, even though like Tom Lennon is the villain. Yeah. He's a likable kind of villain. So like, yeah, yeah, yeah. I, and funny. in the Christmas sure. movie, like, sure, like maybe he doesn't get like his fame that he wanted but like he gets like a new yeah. love in his life and I guess not every you know like a Christmas movie has to have you know great endings for for every character I'm now I'm now thinking of you know Christmas Vacation and uh, what is it, Julia Louis Dreyfus and her husband uh, just you know, constantly uh, like all, all horrible shit keeps happening oh yeah, yeah. No, nothing ever attacked by a dog yeah, or whatever nothing ever <laughs> nice happens to them they, yeah, yeah. they always have a, and like they didn't really even do anything they were just yuppies they were just like so, yuppie annoying neighbors right but, like, they were even that annoying. I I think that every time I watch Christmas Vacation, it's all like these people are full of themselves. They don't deserve this much fucking. Well, throughout the movie, aren't they like kind of poo pooing Christmas? In, yeah, in but general? that's like, not like a that's... reason to destroy their house. No, oh, all right, fine. I don't know. I don't know why I went off on that. <laughs> I agree. I, I think that holiday movies should actually have everybody have a happy ending. I'm sort of going through the Rolodex. I do think that's a thing. And so if they want this to be a holiday movie, because right now it really does just seem like a cold weather movie, yeah. <laughs> then I think that was a missed opportunity. Those two should have been together. That it seemed like great. it was going that way. Yeah. Right? It did. Yeah. Yep, yeah, but it Either... seemed like a lot of things were going a certain way yeah. in this movie. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> 
and and then like the movie ends with with Maynard getting together with uh, Judy Greer. Well, first of all, seconds after he's for, called first of all, he takes his two fifty and change, <laughs> and he goes to a loan office, mm-hmm. and he takes out a loan, even though everyone in town is financially struggling. I guess our assumption is that Maynard now has a surplus of cash, mm-hmm. and what does he choose to do with this cash? He opens a Bigfoot Museum, and the ending of the movie is the assumption that the town is completely saved forever yeah. because everyone comes to bullshit, right? It's like that it's, wouldn't it's happen because that like, wouldn't happen because outside of like the kind of research he did to like know shit about Bigfoot and how he walked. He's not really passionate about Bigfoot. No, he's not. He doesn't know shit about I, him, really. I love so it. So why is he saying, like, now I'm the authority of it, and I have, like, the resolution to just open my own Bigfoot museum? He doesn't know anything about Bigfoot. I love at the end that, so there's, like, the the two guys he in didn't town. Even, he didn't even intend to dress as Bigfoot. No. He just got, he had a yeah. drunken bender because he caught his wife sleeping yeah. with him. Yeah. Or and he, fooling he, around with He someone. wanted to be, like, I guess a gorilla, but this was the best that he could do under the circumstances, and then he just kind of fell like, into the you want to see a man in a costume? I'll give you. Yeah. There, there's the the two characters who set up the Bigfoot business. Who, through a lot of the movie, I kept thinking were a couple. But yeah, they, they, could, they could be a couple. I think they were too, but they yeah. just they didn't. It's all like, well, we can't show like any affection between these two men. But yeah. like, they were kind of coded that way. Yeah, mm-hmm. I, I thought. So. But yeah, and so but at the end, they keep selling like this this Bigfoot merchandise in his store. And at the end, when he gets all the money from them, he asks one of them, Hey, Farm Tony, you say people all over the world love this Bigfoot, right? He's talking like someone who's never heard of Bigfoot in his <laughs> entire life. <laughs> and like even those characters are all like, Um, yeah. Ooh. On every continent and in every language. Yep, yeah, all of them. Yeah. Do they? I don't... I think there's Bigfoot myths in different cultures, but mm-hmm. like, you're talking about Bigfoot... Like he's, I don't know, like Tony Danza or something. You know, it's like, <laughs> everyone loves Tony Danza. He's mm. huge in Japan. Mm. And it's like, I don't know. I don't know why Tony Danza was on my mind. But like, but yeah. I, think I, I know what you're saying. Yeah. Like, like as far as I know, like the Sasquatch myth is like really only kind of big in North America. Mm. Everything else is like, people are like, oh yeah, like he was like some folklore legend. But like, everyone knows he's just like a story. Like there's no kind of mythology of like, he may still be out there and he fascinates the world. No, I think that's, like, strictly a North American thing. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> so I want to talk about the title of this movie. Okay. okay. Uh, Pottersville. Now, have either of you seen It's a Wonderful Life? Yes. You know what? I was going to ask. Yeah. Like, what the fuck is up with, like, the Pottersville yeah. references? So for those of you at home who maybe have not seen It's a Wonderful Life, the plot thread in that movie is that the villain of It's a Wonderful Life is Mr. Potter. He's the evil banker. And he steals money from Jimmy Stewart, and he only cares about, you know, himself, like, greed, oh, he's, he's the bad guy. And then when Jimmy Stewart tries to kill himself, and the angel stops, and then shows him his life if he never existed, he goes back to his home of Bedford Falls, and it has become Pottersville. Mm. The villain has taken over, and has named it Pottersville. Oh. So, why do you think this Christmas movie, this cold weather movie... Mm. Decided to use that specific name for their town. A town which is inherently negative Mm -hmm. in the context of that movie. It's weird, right? I don't have an answer. I just... I just noticed that, and I thought that was a little strange. I think it was intentional. Mm-hmm. Now that you've pointed it out, I think that that was absolutely it, inten- intentional, but I don't understand why. Is this sort of like an Elseworlds tale of like what also happens in like the alternate reality Possibly. of, of I did Pottersville? Also, I did also think near the beginning when he this was... Is, this is Earth 2. I did also <laughs> think near the beginning when Michael Shannon was driving down the snowy streets that this was his character from Groundhog Day years later, and mm-hmm. this is just what ended up happening to Ooh. him. But no, no, I think I think the Pottersville name is intentional because if you look at the poster, the tagline for it is "It's a magical life." Oh, for sure. Yeah, which is first of all, there's no magic in this movie whatsoever. Look, oh. look at this, look at this cover again. You would not think that this is a movie about Sasquatches and furry clubs no. mm-hmm. at all. No. It tricks you into thinking it's like a Hallmark movie, but in reality, yeah. it's a very very weird mm-hmm. film. It's quirky. Uh, filled with furries and moonshine. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. It's like a quirky Jimmy small Stewart town wouldn't movie. be anywhere near a movie like this. Like State and Maine? Quirky small town movie? A little bit, yeah. It's a little a little State and Maine-ish or, or uh, 
Uh, it, it kind of feels a little like a Christopher Guest movie. Mm. You know, in, in, if it was better written, like Christopher Guest would play the Brock Masterson role. The, I mean, the fact that they have, like, you know, just they, they call the movie Pottersville, for some reason my mind gravitates towards, like, those gritty teen dramas, Smallville and Riverdale, <laughs> and they wanted to have, like, you know, the gritty alternate story with, like, mm. just the town name. I guess, yeah. And they wanted the name recognition. I, I yeah. It's weird, though, because the town, uh, in 1928, when Mr. Grieger originally opened that general store... <laughs> Oh, we some, hi- <laughs> some history here, folks. Because I saw the 1928. <laughs> the town must have been wonderful and prosperous. And it also must have still been called Pottersville at that time. So to, to call it Pottersville is confusing. Yes. <laughs> oh, are you... Oh, okay. So when you say Elseworld, are you... Is your assumption... I'm talking about, like, comic book multiverse kind of shit. Yeah. Is it, So, okay. So your, your suggestion, Jameson, is that this is the Pottersville... From the alternate reality that yes. Clarence showed Jimmy Stewart yes. in that movie, and time they, has gone on. Mr. Potter has they, died, and it's just become his own town. There was a timeline split. Oh, you see? <laughs> that's deep. Yeah, he's just busted this thing <laughs> wide open. Exactly. And this, I want to rewatch the movie immediately now because this is just this is a whole new light I'm seeing this movie in. Mm-hmm. Holy shit! <laughs> Branching wow. past. Like, we gotta, we gotta know where the split happened. What other cinematic universes could we, could we, could we tie this Spawn up to? From it's a Wonderful Life. Was there anything either of you wrote down that we wanted to talk about? I just wanted to point out, Ian McShane has the best lines. Absolutely. In this movie, he's mm. great. Like, uh, I love uh, Thomas Lennon it says, like, oh, you're calling me stupid. And he says, no, I don't think you're stupid. I just think maybe sometimes when it comes to thinking, yeah, bad luck. That's a yeah. great fucking And line. he also has my favorite line in the entire movie. Thomas Lennon asks him, do you have any moonshine left? He says, if a snake had ears, would you screw it? <laughs> and Thomas Lennon just yes. looks down like, he gives, no. us, he gives us a second like... <laughs> What? Two things I wanted to bring up. Yeah. Uh, so just because, like, you know, now that Kevin and I have been, like, been doing our fair share of research for yeah. our Sasquatch cartoon, one thing he brought to my attention was that Bigfoot Hunters, one of their legit, like, quote, like, legit uh, techniques for uh, attracting Bigfoot is to knock sticks together, and they call it wood knocking, and they fucking did that a couple of times in this I'm movie. So, I'm sorry. They call it wood knocking. Take it up with, with Kevin, man. <laughs> Take it up with Kevin. I mean... That's clearly a real life Brock Masterson type person mm-hmm. who coined that term. Mm-hmm. T- w- tapping two sticks together is called wood knocking. You uh, say just, I never would have assumed that. I'm just saying that, like we did our research, and it, it turns out this movie did too. <laughs> Doing like those Bigfoot hunt, like tr- tr- taking it legit, you know, yeah. like you know, taking it seriously. Yeah. This is almost a documentary. Yeah. Uh, and the other thing I wanted to bring up was uh, there was a sequence where Tom Lennon's character. He has um, a callback to that fucking Christian Bale rant that happened oh, God, like, right, like 10 yeah. years ago or whatever. Yeah. What are you doing? What are you doing? I'm sorry? You're sorry? You're sorry you are eat, eat in my eyeline when I'm doing the intro of my lifetime. Maybe greatest intro ever, and I've got you in my eyeline with this. Huh? Yeah. What's that? Are you professional? Yeah. Yeah? Uh, yeah, but preffy. Huh? I what was, do you... Uh, use your head, mate. What were you doing? I was... Huh? I, 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 I was checking the light. Checking the light. He's checking the light. He's checking the light. How was it? How's the light? Because the show now is rubbish. He's having an argument with, like, At 2017, sound. that Christian Bale joke would have been at least 10 years old at that time. For people who don't even remember that, Christian Bale was making his Terminator movie. He, he freaked out at the director of photography, and someone someone captured it on recording, yeah, and it's yeah. just him. It's just it's just him going on. It's, it's the whole, uh, oh, good for you! Yeah. And how was it? <laughs> he doesn't quite do the same thing, but that's very clearly what he was it trying to do. It goes on for long enough. And I think they like they, like mentioned a few things that he said. Do but you, it was... do you think it was meant to be a parody of the Christian Bale thing, I or think do so. we do we just associate Christian Bale with actors freaking out at crew members now because that was so I mean prevalent I, at the time? I mean I don't like I like I know it was like sort of like oh that's very off putting for Christian, but I haven't yeah. heard of uh, too many incidents where he's done that since. No, he's in interviews. He said like. That was a really shitty thing for me to do. I've apologized to the guy. Yeah. I've apologized to everyone. And it's like, yeah, you know, people lose their temper sometimes. Mm-hmm. People, the actors, uh, celebrities are people just like everyone. We are, we are furry apologists <laughs> and Christian Bale apologists yeah, on this yeah. podcast today. 
Uh, yeah, but I'd rather not get sued by either. But yeah, it was just a weird thing to do, and like, I get they want to show that Brock character is like very full of himself, and like Mm. treats the people around him like shit. I just thought maybe there was, like, could they not have thought of like a better avenue to take that down than like, hey, remember when Christian Bale did this? Maybe, Mm. maybe at the point they made this movie, that was still the most relevant person freaking out at a crew member thing that they could do. Who Mm. knows? What did you want to mention? I have a couple of things. Okay. Um, So, number one, not a lot of uh, big roles for women in this movie. Mm -hmm. Um, And Christina Hendricks, she, yeah, I mean, I I love her, but her character was not likable. She's so great. So, maybe that just became a thing where she was auditioning and getting cast in those roles. And, like, good for her for being cast. So, oh, yeah, get, get that money. Yeah. But I love, I have to say, I, so I don't really know Judy Greer from other stuff, but I actually really loved the, the stuff that she did in this movie. Mm-hmm. I love that she got her big scene where she, like, confronts the town. I thought her acting was really right there and on point just with, like, all the men who were who were leads and strong. Because hmm. there were some smaller characters in this movie who those actors, like, weren't really hitting hitting their mark every time. Yeah. But Judy Greer, like, super cool to see her do that. Yeah. As I said, like, I've only ever seen her in comedic stuff, so to mm-hmm. see her, like, you know, play, like, the, like, a lot of stuff with some gravitas, like, it was, wow, she's a much better actress than, like, I've ever really noticed from her before. Yeah. That's awesome. Yeah. Yeah. That's this so is, cool. It's not a movie that passes the Bechdel test, I think. There's only two. I think there's I only agree. two female. There's three. Well, there's only two female characters that talk to each other, and it's the two old lady, and they're talking about Bigfoot. Oh, right. yes. So they are technically talking about a man. So that's I don't. Right. Maybe that's kind of on the line. Uh, hard, hard to say. Yeah. yeah. So there's that, but yeah, I thought that I, it was just really cool to see her do that. Number two, super fun. So I know Ron Perlman from Sons of Anarchy, mm-hmm. where he's where he's really bad. Oh yeah, and so it was really fun to see him be goofy. I liked um, him in this movie. He was very good. Ron Perlman's a national treasure. Yeah, like, he's great. He looked like he's he was great. having a blast in this yeah. movie. And is he just that that hat? Yeah, yeah. Her sheriff's hat. See this movie just to see him in that hat. Mm-hmm. Um, is Judy Greer Canadian? No, she's oh, American. Oh, okay. Never mind. I thought she maybe. I'm was. trying to think. I'm trying to think of what else you might have seen her in. I'll I'll, I'll look up her IMDb. She was in okay. Ant Man. She was in Ant Man. She's she's Paul Rudd's ex wife in Ant Man. Mm. Um, she's on Archer. She is uh, in Arrested Development. Uh, she's in Jurassic World. I might know her from Arrested Development. Uh, she was Kitty, the um, uh, the receptionist who kept. Flashing herself when she was like, "Say goodbye to these." In the new Arrested Development? No, in the original. Like, on the I, I actually don't remember that. She's in okay. thirteen, going on thirty. She's on twenty-seven yep. dresses. Uh, yeah, lots of wrong. Yeah, I'm sure that I've like seen yeah, yeah, yeah. Her around. And then my last thing. So I feel like I was catching product uh, brand references, right? Because. When he said, like, isn't that literally a, a beer ad? Like, Foster's? Now, where do we get a Foster's, huh? Foster's. It's Australian for beer. Yeah. Like, oh, yeah. Oh, yeah, that, like, was, that, was, that was that was a long-running a beer ad. Foster's, Australian for beer. Mm-hmm. Okay. Which should have been their first hint that it wasn't really Australian, because <laughs> no one in Australia <laughs> drinks Foster's. Oh, okay. That's a North American campaign mm-hmm. to try and sell on the kitsch Foster's, value of yeah. Australian things being cute. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So, never mind. I was like, that was really heavy-handed. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Um, is Jiffy Pop a brand of pop? It is. Yes. Yeah. It's like a short... Well, I'm, I imagine for certain people, it's a shorthand uh, for popcorn, the way Kleenex oh, is a shorthand okay. for tissues. Okay. You know, let's get together with, with some Jiffy Pop. Yeah. In front of the TV, I so think that's, I think that's something a lot of small town American people say. So, uh, so in that respect, uh, it was it was right on the nose. Cool. Okay. Yeah. To close things out, I'm going to share probably one of the most uh, weirdest pieces of trivia about this movie that uh, I was actually, I was actually going to say it at the beginning, but I forgot about it. Uh, so this movie has lots of uh, producers, lots of executive producers. One executive producer that I forgot to mention is Patricia Hurst, as in. Patty Hearst, the woman who, uh, the socialite who was kidnapped by a, an extremist group in the, was it the 60s or the 70s? Have you, have neither of you heard of Patty Hearst? No, no. Okay, so this was like a woman. This, this was like a woman. She was like a, like a, a, a came from a, ri- a rich family and uh, she was uh, kidnapped by an extremist group and her name is sort of synonymous with uh, Stockholm Syndrome. 
because oh. she was kidnapped, but then over the course of staying with them, she ended up believing in their cause, Ooh. and she ended up, like, joining them on their, like, guerrilla missions and everything, mm. and she, like, had, like, a gun and everything, and then when they eventually got her back and everything, she got to go back to, like, society and it was a, a big talking point at, at a, for, for it, a, a bit anyway like she had like her her 24 hours of fame or whatever as this person who kind of went and did like this it, it was in these uh, crazy circumstances and then uh, went on to uh, infamy but uh, I guess um, I, I guess over the years people uh, might have forgotten that story I, I just sort of remember hearing about it uh, she, um, she ended up, uh, uh, appearing in a lot of John Waters movies. Mm. Like, she's in Serial Mom, and so, yeah, she had, like, a late, uh, period career. They made a movie based on her life called Patty Hearst, Natasha Richardson, directed by Paul Schrader. Yeah, and now she's producing <laughs> Pottersville. And, you, and, like, I, I certainly thought, oh, does Patty Hearst produce movies now? Nope, just this one. Okay. So, uh, yeah, Ooh. it's a weird little, uh, <laughs> bit of, for, some people out there are gonna know who Patty Hearst is and are gonna think that's fascinating, but I kinda thought that was super weird. Oh, Merry Christmas, everyone. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Huh. All right. Well, anyway, on that note, Zosha Jameson, would you recommend people watch Pottersville this holiday season? Hmm. I would recommend it if you want to see Ron Perlman in that hat. Um, <laughs> also, um, if, I don't know, if you kind of want to see like a quirky, like Sasquatch Christmas-ish movie, yeah. um, if that's your thing, I wouldn't really say that it's heartwarming or Ooh. anything or really a Christmas movie, to be honest. But yeah, if you want, if you want to watch like those three co- guys like do some fun comedy, I don't know. Sure. Uh, yeah, like I actually would kind of recommend this movie. I think it's just quirky enough that like it works as like a like a goofy comedy, and like it's around the holidays, so like I get the feeling like you could like watch it with grandma and yeah, like and all yeah. like all the family. I think grandma like, will have some questions about um, some of the material. I right, mean but... like I'm gonna <laughs> we're gonna have to pause the movie and kinda like explain later. They do a pretty good job of explaining what a fur furry is. is. Yes. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, I think this movie's harmless. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I think I I certainly don't regret watching it. Yeah, I I think uh, the writing isn't great and I think I would have preferred less Lennon and more Shannon. Uh, but, oh, uh, d- <laughs> less Lennon, and I, and more I, Shannon, less Lennon, more Shannon. I'm, I'm opposite. I'm, I'm on team more Lennon, less Shannon. Oh my God. <laughs> God, we gotta get t-shirts made. Yeah. <laughs> Pick your side. <laughs> like for more Shannon. Uh, re- retweet for more Lennon. <laughs> oh my God. Oh gosh. Sosha, thank you so much for thank coming you for being on here. the show. Thank you You're welcome. Yes. Thank you for having me. This was really fun. Yeah, I was so glad you could come. What do you have? have to plug oh okay so i am in uh, a musical improv group called off key improv uh which you mentioned at the beginning of the show um we do improvised musicals so hour-long musicals um in different styles uh for example uh this december we're doing a rogers and hammerstein style musical wow so it's uh, in the no style big deal. No no big deal. Deal. Yeah. Uh, it's in the style of like the sound of music or oklahoma um and really easy stuff to just kind of slip into yeah uh <laughs> well we have a musical director we have some musicians who work with us they're every they're amazing. So our next show, that's this is what I'm plugging. Uh, our next show uh, that, that um, we are doing is going to be uh, on Saturday, February 1st. Um, and it's at the Havana on Commercial Drive. Mm-hmm. Um, and it's just going to be a great show. Uh, it's going to have something to do with Valentine's Day because it's our February show. Mm-hmm. Um, and yeah. It's yeah. gonna be super fun. Yeah, they're Wonderful. super. They're super fun. I've got, I've got caught one of them. Yeah, 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 yeah. Uh, and then also, I co-wrote and acted in and co-produced a, a short film. It's the grand finale, Ooh. and that I'm putting together. Uh, I think a screening of it in Vancouver at some point, but. And eventually we will release it so that people can see it online. But right now we're still submitting it to film festivals. So I just wanted to like say that because I'm excited about mm. it. Fantastic. But and when you and when you have more information about it, let me know and I'll make sure I throw it up on our Instagram page so Ooh. people can follow that and actually go see that when it comes out. Absolutely. Thank you. Yeah. Great. That sounds awesome. Uh, Jameson, what do you got going on? Uh... As of right Still in the middle of crunch time? No, no, no. I'm all, I'm all done crunch We're time. We're done. Oh, I'm oh done. Okay. yeah, yeah, yeah. So the game, is, the game is finished? Yes. Well, I mean, like, 
presently, no. But like by okay. the time this airs, like it would have already been up right. like, for a couple of days. So I hope everyone is uh, in, enjoying Met Warrior Five. As far as like things that I've been into lately, like, like uh, I just watched The Irishman over the weekend. Yep, which I thoroughly that's a enjoyed. long movie. Long movie, but uh, totally worth it. No, I'm just like looking forward to spending time with the family and friends over the holidays. Yeah, fantastic, mm-hmm. great. Well, I'm going to keep it in the Netflix house. I'm going to recommend. Uh, I saw a movie uh, a couple of nights ago that I think probably is my favorite movie of 2019. I was enthralled all the way through it. It is a French animated movie called I Lost My Body. And it is a story about uh, a severed hand that wakes up in the morgue. It's trapped in a bag. And it uh, wakes up and it escapes from the morgue. And it goes through the entire city on a journey of, a perilous journey to, to get back to its body. And as it's uh, trying to get back to its body, it flashes back to who he was attached to. And it shows uh, the life of this young man. Uh, it's, it's brilliant. It's beautiful. The animation is spellbinding. It's a very human movie. It kind of changes genres every 10 minutes. It really related to me a lot because uh, it's about a lot of different things, but on one level, it is about a young man with certain ideas about life and relationships who makes a what he feels is a grand romantic gesture that turns out to be ill thought out and kind of creepy. And so basically, and, like my the prime of my dating years. Yes, I don't know why specifically. I related to that mm-hmm. movie. I, I certainly haven't done anything of that ilk, but it's it, it, it's brilliant. It's on Netflix. It's about an hour and a half. It's it's just a gorgeous, beautiful film. I highly recommend everyone see that. And uh, keeping on Netflix, uh, if you're if you're also uh, looking for something to watch on Netflix, season three of The Dragon Prince is now oh, yes, out with, with a friend of the show Paula Burroughs on. Yes, it. Yeah. so yes, uh, watch that, and uh, after you're done, uh, go back and uh, listen to our Underdogs episode, uh, which Paula uh, was our guest on mm-hmm. to uh, pump that. So uh, uh, merry uh, merry whatever everyone, merry yeah. merry merry Christmas, happy Hanukkah, joyous Kwanzaa, whatever. Have a just say happy holidays, um, man. <laughs> Rub a dub, Ramadan. Uh, I didn't know. Rub a dub, Ramadan. I really didn't think that one through. <laughs> and uh, we're gonna try and squeeze out one more episode before this this year is over. But we, you know, we we both have busy lives. I'm going away for the holidays. It might not drop until 2020, but so if that happens, uh, Happy New Year, everyone. Mm-hmm. Uh, we love you all. Thank you for uh, spending uh, the year listening to this podcast with yeah. us. We really it's been, appreciate it. It's been a lot it. of fun. This has been uh, like, just like a good like experience, just like sitting down watching some crummy movies yeah. and uh, just riffing on them. It's, it's, uh, it's never a bad time. It's never a bad time. Mm-hmm. I concur. All mm-hmm. right. We'll catch you next time, everyone. Bye. We're Bye. all waving. I, w- I want to yeah. point out that we're all Goodbye. waving Goodbye. at the computer Goodbye. like absolute maniacs right now. <laughs> all right. <laughs>